<laughs> I don't know. Straight talk. Money matters. International news. Celebrity interviews. Sports. If I'm being discriminated based on my race, it's not politics. Race. Let's switch it around. Let's talk health care. Straight talk with award-winning journalist Lloyd Geit. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm your host, Lloyd Geit. There's a new book out. It's called You Can't Make This Stuff Up, Tales from a Judicial Diva, and it's written by federal judge Vanessa Gilmore. She is joining us today on Straight Talk. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is one funny, funny book, and you know that. I do. I absolutely do. First of all, tell me what a federal judge is does Miss Federal Judge? Well, federal judges are appointed for life uh, by the President of the United States and we handle cases that arise under the laws and the Constitution of the United States. Give me an example of what kind of cases which will tell people a little bit about why you wrote this book. Well, we handle criminal cases, we handle civil cases. Uh, I'm probably best known for handling many of the Enron trials that were he held here in Houston a few years back. And we do bankruptcy, social security, just a variety of things that fall under federal law. Tell me about this book. You can't make this stuff up. Well, people see judges, and most of us, as one-dimensional. They think that whatever way they see you at work is the way that you are all day long. People can't imagine you outside of your robe. But all of us are multifaceted people. And I like to tell people that I have the best, funniest personality of anybody that I know. I think I know every joke in the world. I understand you actually do know every joke in the world. I think that I do. And, and as you may recall, Lloyd, a few years back, I wrote a, a more serious book for children whose parents were incarcerated uh, called A Boy Named Rocky. But this time I decided that when I uh, wanted to sit down at the computer uh, and write again, I wanted to do something a little bit more irreverent and something that showed the other side of my personality. Well, you certainly did do that with this book. I've read the book from cover to cover. <laughs> it is hilarious. That's what everybody tells me, that they start reading it and they cannot put it down because they can't stop laughing. Okay, I'm going to take some of these stories one by one. <laughs> All right. The Wizenator. The Wizenator. People probably have never heard of a Wizenator, but uh, a Wizenator is a, a device that people use to try to beat drug tests. It is an artificial um, member, let's just call it. Or penis. Okay, <laughs> I'll let you say it. I won't say it. This is your show. <laughs> Uh, and this was an interesting little case where I had a guy that I was trying to help get sort of reintroduced into society after having been uh, incarcerated for a time. And we try to really sort of help people uh, on their way by making sure that they don't accidentally revert to the use of drugs or, or, or alcohol. And so uh, we have them come in for uh, what we call UAs, which are uh, urinalysis tests, so that we can determine whether they may have accidentally slipped off the wagon. And I could give them help, you know, get them back into some sort of treatment. And this gentleman decided that he would come in and use this Wizenator device, uh, which you utilize with uh, rehydrated urine that is probably bought from uh, the parents of uh, the school children who have clean urine. And so they bring that in and they put this in this little device and they expel it. Uh, even has a little heater in it, actually, uh, so that when you turn in your sample, it seems just right. And uh, but this young man, unfortunately, he was African American. Uh, and unfortunately, I guess when he went on the Wizenator website and uh, purchased his device, he neglected to uh, notice that they came in different shades. And uh, so he was in there actually with a white one. And it did not quite work out too well for him because the probation officers kind of glanced in to make sure that there's no hanky-panky going on. And imagine their surprise when they saw our little chocolate friend with a white Wizenator. <laughs> And then he had to come and face me after that. Now, the way they saw him is that you can't close the door. You can't close the door. They have to be able to take a little peek if they want to. They don't stand there and stare, but they'll kind of do a little peek every once in a while and imagine how they felt when they walked by and they had to do a double take and they said, uh-oh. And But the funniest part was for me trying to keep a straight face when this poor guy had to come and sit and, and explain to me what had happened. I had to bite the inside of my jaw to keep from laughing. Did he tell you that the reason he didn't have a black wizenator did he say why? He, he, he didn't have a good answer, Lloyd. And, and I tell you what, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so a fake penis. Who would even imagine that people would have this device and try to 
pretend that they... It, you know what? There are so many enterprising people. The one thing that I have learned from, from having this job is that there are people out there that are so smart. If they would just channel that intelligence something into legal, a legitimate into way, <laughs> the world would be a better place for how many smart people there are that are out there but they're just committing crimes. What can I tell you? It's kind of funny. So what did you tell this guy? I, you know what? I just had to give him another opportunity to come on down and hang out with us for a little while. We call it three hots and a cot. Back to, <laughs> back to prison. <laughs> just for a little bit. Just for a little bit. <laughs> now, a lot of crooks are just straight up dumb, aren't they? You know, some are, but some are actually really smart. You know, I was uh, mentioning to you that there's one of the stories in the book about a guy uh, who you might have thought that he was not smart. The homeless guy. I thought it was a homeless guy. And it wasn't that he was not smart. He was schizophrenic and he was having a lot of difficulties because of that. But he was smart. He decided one day that what he really wanted and what he really needed was some medication. And if you're poor and you don't have access to health care in this country, you know where there's free medication? In prison. And so he decided that he would go and rob a bank and make sure it was a federally insured bank so that he could get to federal prison and get some medication. And that's what this guy did. He goes and he gets a, uh, a piece of paper and he writes on there, give me the money or I will shot you. I will shot you. I will shot you. I won't shoot you. He, he, you know, he, I didn't <laughs> say that he could smell. I just said that he had good sense. And he went and he robbed a bank and then he sat outside and waited for the police to show up. But of course they ran right past him because he was a homeless guy. And he was like, wait, it's me, the robber, <laughs> running after these police officers. But what was so interesting to me about this case and, and, and made it sort of a noteworthy story for uh, the book, You Can't Make This Stuff Up, is that once he got in prison and got on medication, he was doing so well that he wanted to argue against his lawyer at the sentencing to try to get as much time as he possibly could. I felt that I was in some twilight zone sentencing where the lawyer is arguing for diminished capacity and the guy's like, hey, you shut up. I want more time. I want to be here. So I say he might have been crazy, but he was not stupid. And he got what he wanted. And he got what he wanted. That was one of the instances in which I gave somebody more time than I might have ordinarily done because I felt that you know, this guy knew, he had good sense. It reminded me of a, of a joke that my dad used to tell us when we were young about a guy who breaks down in front of a, uh, of a mental institution and he's trying His vehicle to, breaks his down. His vehicle breaks down and he's trying to change the tire on the car and all the lug nuts run off into the drain and a guy yells from behind the fence, hey, take one lug nut off of each of the other three tires and put it on that one and you'll be okay. And he says, I thought you were crazy. He says, I'm crazy, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes you have to give people uh, credit for really understanding what their situation is and trying to make the best out of a bad situation. You got to tell me about the bank robber, the one who didn't think the camera was rolling, or he knew it was rolling, but <laughs> tell me about well, that. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of, you, in the media, you know all kinds of crazy stories about when you think cameras aren't rolling. But this young man, uh, actually had a friend uh, tell him that he could rob a bank and not be seen as long as he put lemon juice on his face. Can you imagine? And so this is this is real. This is a real story. He showed up in the prosecutor's office uh, with his attorney and when they rolled the tape and showed him robbing the bank, he was completely dismayed because he said, oh my gosh, they can they can see my face. And the prosecutor said, well, yeah, of course you he didn't have anything covering it. He said, but my friend said that if I put lemon juice on my face, that it would be invisible to the camera. I think his friend kept that invisible lemon juice. It's kind of like the cloak in Harry Potter. You can put it over your head, no one can see it. Somehow or another, he actually believed that if he went into a bank with just lemon juice on his face, that he would be able to get away with it. I know. You can't he make this smeared stuff up. Lemon juice. <laughs> he smeared lemon juice on his face. Absolutely. He thought that would hide him from the camera. That he thought that would hide him from the camera. And I know you don't believe me, but I'm telling you, Lloyd, you can't make this stuff up. For so many years, I've told my friends these crazy stories. And every time I would tell somebody one of these stories. You're making this up. They would say, you're making this up. This isn't true. I'd say, no, really, you can't make this stuff up. And then they would say, 
you should write a book about this. And so you did. And so I did. Although actually, you know, honestly, I didn't start out with the idea of writing this book. I would just write these short stories all of the time because I just thought that they were funny and it just always would tickle me to go back and read them. But I really started out writing another book, a novel, a, a, a fiction novel. And I had an editor who was helping me uh, with that one called Saving the Dream about a little boy who was uh, adopted and the story that he lived with his uh, adopted mother and the alternate story of the life that he might have lived with his birth mother, sort of a sliding door story. And I was working on that book with my editor and I started telling her some of these stories. And she said, those stories are hilarious. You should write a book about it. I said, no, it's not a book. She says, let me see that book. And then she said, I said, I don't have a book. And she said, just send me a few stories. And so I did. And she called me up and she said, I'm putting your novel down. This is the next book that I want you to write. I said, are you sure? And she said, write this book. I'm telling you, people are going to love it. And it's been interesting because people have called me and said, you know, we, it's in this time, we just want something fun. We want something to laugh about. We want something that's lighthearted instead of all of the serious things that we have to deal with right now in the world. And, and so that's why people have really enjoyed reading the book because it just gives people a break for a minute and something to laugh about. So what happened to the bank robber? Once he realized that... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we gave him an invitation to. <laughs> an invitation to go to prison. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you, you, sometimes you just can't avoid that. And every once in a while, we think that it does people, some people, some good. It does. Let's talk about the womanizer, the man who had the swagger and just tried to put, <laughs> tried to put the moves on you. He was a really smooth Denzel Washington kind of guy. Well, Lloyd, what can I tell you? You know, life as a, as a federal judge, as a single woman federal judge, is a little bit difficult. There aren't that many people who just feel like they can just approach you. And I don't know why, because you know me, and I'm one of the most approachable people that you, you know. You are. But you know who decides that they, that they will try to approach me from time to time? Believe it or not prisoners and people that are facing me for sentencing and so one of the crazy stories that I talk about in the book is about this this gentleman who approached me uh, in the courtroom came up to my bench I was getting ready to take his plea and he had decided to plead guilty to uh, the offense that he was charged with and there was just something about him that you could tell was different just from the moment he walked into to the courtroom you know most people come appropriately dressed but this man looked like he was ready to go out to dinner in the finest restaurant in town I mean he just had the suit pinstripe fresh haircut nice shave French cuff shirt with the monograms and the and I mean he was just ready to go he didn't look like he was on his way to court or to prison for that matter <laughs> or to prison. and he came just sort of with this swagger walking in the courtroom I mean, you know that swagger I'm talking about it's that Denzel Washington mm -hmm. walk mm -hmm. where you when they walk in the room everybody turns around to look and everybody turned around to look but the other thing that made everybody turn around to look at this guy was the fact that he had on so much cologne that you could almost be asphyxiated by the amount of cologne that he had he came up to the bench and um, he walks up and so I say state your name he says Denzel Washington okay not really but <laughs> something like <laughs> he, he could have and uh, I said, I understand you're here to enter a plea of guilty in the case before the court. And he says, oh, yes, Your Honor. I thought, did he, did he just kind of wink at me? I think he did. And, and then it just kept going on and on. I'd ask him a question. He'd kind of shake his shoulders at me. And I'd ask him another question. And he'd kind of wink at me a little bit. And I thought to myself, he's, he's flirting with me while I'm taking his plea. But <laughs> the question would be, why? I mean, what would be the reason that you could imagine something like that happening? You're not going to send me to prison. Hmm, not likely. <laughs> <laughs> you going to get a better sentence? Hmm, I don't not think likely. so. Not likely. Um, I'm going to ask the prosecutor to let him go. Hmm, no, not likely. There's no good reason. I couldn't think of a single good reason. And I, and I thought to myself, am I the only one noticing this? And so, but later my case manager said to me, Judge, did you see that guy flirting with you during the play? And I said, yeah. I said, okay, I wasn't the only one. I thought, am I crazy? Am I just imagining this? Has it just been too long since somebody flirted with me? <laughs> I don't think so. But bottom line. Bottom line. He went to prison. Oh, my goodness. What can I say? Three hots and a cot again. Oh, my God. What can I tell you? That's just the way that it goes. But it gave me an interesting story to talk about. It did. It did. <laughs> now, you had lots of prisoners hit on you. Guys who are in the tank already, they seem to love you. They want you. 
I don't know why that is. It's like every time my picture appears in the newspaper, I get a letter from somebody. Judge Gilmore, since I saw your picture in the newspaper, I haven't looked at another woman. Well, as if there were women there to look at in the prison. I'm thinking uh, that would sound pretty good if it was somebody who was in the free world, but <laughs> for somebody who's in prison, it's not such a it's not such a compliment. <laughs> These guys love you. They do. They do. They One of them even had you to fill out a questionnaire or wanted you to. Wanted me to fill out a questionnaire, sent me a questionnaire because, of course, he wanted to make sure that I could rise to his high standards. And so he gave me a questionnaire to fill out so he could make up his mind whether or not I was worthy of somebody that he might want to date. Absolutely. He wanted to know if you smoked. I wanted to know if I smoked. I think that was going to be a deal breaker for him. He wanted to know if I had a telephone. I wasn't sure if that was a real question. Um, my favorite color and my favorite movie and just, you know, the kinds of things that people would generally uh, want to know about each other as they were getting to know each other. But he sent it to me in a questionnaire form. Did you respond to this prisoner? Uh, I did not. But I saved the questionnaire because I thought that it was quite clever. <laughs> but you've had people to draw stuff and send you Thing. All kinds of things that there was one gentleman, somehow or another, uh, you know, in, in some publication, it must have listed where I went to church. And so this gentleman, instead of sending me things to the courthouse for years, he sent me little cards uh, to Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, and the ladies over there, the first couple of times they opened the envelopes and then they wrote me a little note that said, uh, open by mistake, sorry, this must be some mail for you. Uh, but then for years, he continued to send me hand-drawn and hand-painted, very, very good artists, hand-painted cards uh, to Wheeler Avenue. And somehow or another, the ladies always managed to accidentally open those. And, and before they sent them on to me, I think they were trying to figure out whether or not we were having a little love affair there, uh, but, which presumably, uh, if I was, I would have given him my real address. But in any event, they decided that they would see how things were going with us. But he just kept writing me. And finally, I think after uh, he uh, wrote me and told me that he was getting out and he was hoping that I would acknowledge and, and uh, so that he would have an opportunity to come and visit. And when I never did give him an acknowledgement, that was, alas, the end of my beautiful cards. <laughs> what can I tell you? But you know, if you want a man, <laughs> I was going to say they're out there, but actually they're in there. They're in there. There are lots of them looking for people to write to. And uh, somehow or another, I've, I've made the list. I understand that my picture is actually pinned up in a couple of prisons. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to know what they're doing with my picture, but I do understand that my, my, they're either throwing darts at it or something else. But in any event, I understand from at least one or two prisoners that I'm the pinup girl in a couple of places. <laughs> now briefly tell me about the rap artist. Oh my goodness, I can't believe you remember that story. It's just, it was so funny because you know, when you, when you uh, have somebody who's in there for sentencing, uh, they have an opportunity to speak, to say something on their own behalf because um, you know, I keep an open mind and I want to hear from people. And I want to understand what was going on with them. It helps me and it influences me in terms of the decision making process. Uh, but this one gentleman decided, I guess, for whatever reason, that the best way to reach me uh, was to write a rap song in my honor and to perform it in the courtroom uh, at his sentencing. Uh, to try to uh, see if that might uh, sway you, sway me in some way. It, it was rather interesting. He told me he had already filed it at the Library of Congress, and he wanted to let me know that it was there. And uh, the uh, chorus of it was, uh, Vanessa Gilmore was my judge in my federal case. She said, you got drama in your life. Get out of my face. <laughs> With the beat. <laughs> I, we were all kind of perplexed. I didn't quite know what to do. I wasn't sure if I should clap or get down off the bench and give him a high five or a fist bump <laughs> or just kind of sit there. And so finally he told me that he was finished and he gave me a copy of the song, which I kept. And uh, I've uh, included a, a copy of it in the book. <laughs> but I want to say to anybody who's listening, don't try that. Not a good idea. <laughs> so he went off to prison. He had to go. He had to go. Oh. Sad to say. Oh. Sad to say. Um. You're something else. You, I mean, this book is just absolutely hilarious. And you know, I have more fun, Lloyd, than I think anybody that I know. I have a great job. I get to be intellectually stimulated, but I also get to let my personality come out as well. By day, you're a federal judge, but you also get out into the community. Have you run into people that you've actually sentenced who are now in the free world? I have on a couple of occasions, and it's, it's uh, an interesting experience, but most of the time I think that uh, it doesn't bother me at all. 
uh, because I treat people with dignity and respect and uh, when you smile at people uh, and try to treat them well, I think that they really can appreciate the fact that uh, you're just doing what you have to do uh, and that they understand the consequences of their actions. But I have run into a few people from time to time. Not scary? It is really not scary. Uh, sometimes it feels a little bit uncomfortable. I ran into this one guy. Uh, at a golf tournament once and a friend of mine said oh my gosh look who's coming and I kept trying to like scooch over and this is a man you had sentenced to prison that I had sentenced to prison and uh, I was hoping not to have to encounter him uh, but he tapped on my shoulder when I felt that dreaded tap I turned around and and I was trying to figure out how do you make small talk with right. someone when the only relationship that you've had is that you've sent them to prison. And we were both playing in a charity golf tournament. And he said, I just wanted to say something to you. And I thought, oh my gosh, here it comes. And he said, I wanted to say thank you. And uh, he said, because I felt like you treated me well and uh, that you treated me respectfully. And, and I think I've learned my lesson. I had some guy call in on a radio talk show one time and say the same thing to me and say that he uh, felt that since I had treated him well and, and talked nice to him in court, that he would go and do what he had to do. And uh, he did. He came out. He told me he was a deacon in his church and he was doing well. And he just wanted to say thank you to me. And so I think that, you know, we can do our jobs and uh, we may be on opposite sides of the fence. We can disagree, but there's no reason to be disagreeable. Uh, I have a uh, personality that doesn't allow me to let meanness in, come out. Uh, that's why I wrote this silly book, because uh, I like to look at the light side of life and the light side of things. And I've been pleasantly surprised by how many times I've gotten letters from uh, parents of people saying, thank you for treating my son with respect. Wow, how cool. Now, let's say that people want to get the book. They can get it from my website, vanessagilmore.com, uh, and also find out information about uh, upcoming appearances uh, from my Facebook page, Vanessa D. Gilmore, uh, author. Uh, lots of information on where I'll be next and uh, how they can come out and meet me. I'd love to see some of your audience and meet them at some of my upcoming signings uh, around town and uh, love to hear from folks. But vanessagilmore.com is my website. They can purchase the book there. So what's next for you? Another funny book? Because I'm sure there are lots of other funny stories you haven't told. There are some more stories inside of me. Uh, can this, this book is actually being considered by uh, a rather well-known playwright as a potential for a one-woman show. And so I'm hoping that if that comes to pass, people can find out about it. Keep up with me on my website uh, or on Facebook. And uh, there's lots coming down the road for me, I think. Well, we've only touched on a few of the funny stories in here. There's still lots more stories I'm glad in here. you didn't give them all away. I'm glad you didn't give them all away because I think that people will enjoy them. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, like I said, I read it from cover to cover and thoroughly enjoyed it. We have been talking with uh, federal judge Vanessa Gilmore. This is her book. It is funny. You cannot make this stuff up, and you really can't make it up. It is so hilarious. Tales from a Judicial Diva. We want to thank you so much for joining us today on Straight Talk. Thank you for having me. Straight Talk with award-winning journalist Lloyd Geit.